Absolutely. Well, good morning, New Life Church. Good morning, New Life Church. Thank you to those who joined us here in the church this morning and to those who are tuning in online. Welcome here. Why don't you stand right where you are? Let's lift up some praises to our God. in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I'll be singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you enough you are the Lord Almighty now shining on stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean no nothing else compares creation calls all to the Savior here this morning. May we be reminded that it says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. May He reveal us to us His vision for our lives here this morning. Oh 
Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my light. Be Thou my wisdom and Thou my true
when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand or fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand or fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh 
Thank you, Jesus. Please be seated. Well, amen. What a wonderful privilege to be able to sing together, to hear voices lifted up together in this room. Good morning as well. It's so good to be with you all here today. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to you. If that is true of you, if this is your first Sunday here at New Life Church, we'd invite you after the service to head out to a little kiosk we have near the doors you probably would have walked in. We call that our Welcome Center. There's some people there who have a gift that they would love to give you as a thank you for being with us this Sunday. A few announcements, some things coming up in the life of our church. It's spring, coming on summer, which means there's a lot of barbecues, which is really exciting for me. So the first of those, and I don't really know how you qualify for this, it's a senior's barbecue, but if this is kind of just self-identifying, for the sake of a barbecue, I'll call myself a senior. So I don't know. I, I don't know. You'll have to ask Paul and Marlene Harris for any more details about if there's a specific age range they have in mind. But that's happening Saturday, June the 4th, starting at 3 p.m. If you want any more details, you can talk to Paul and Marlene or Howard Moore, but he's on a couple of weeks of holidays right now. We also have our newcomer's barbecue coming up on June 12th. So if you are relatively new to the life of our church, um, or if you've been here for a while but weren't able to attend some of the previous newcomers' lunches, or if this is your first Sunday and you're hearing about this right now, we want to invite you to come to our newcomers' barbecue on June 12th. That's here at the church right after our second service. You can register for that online through our church website or come and talk to me or call the church office. We'd love to register you for it. We also have coming up in just a few weeks, highway cleanup. If you want some exercise, you want to serve a little bit in the town, we, as a church, have the responsibility of caring for a stretch of Highway 236. So on May 28th, if you meet at the church um, at 9 a.m., we'd love your help on cleaning up that stretch of highway. And finally, we have a job opening. Katie Ronald has filled in extremely valiantly in our role of office administrator for... Yes, actually. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate that. Katie has done an amazing job. We're going to miss her, but she is going on to greater things starting June 1st at a new job. And so we need to fill that role. So if that's something that interests you, you can find the job description online on our website, or you can talk to Rusty or myself or Susan. I'm sure we'd love to get you a job description. We'd love for you to apply for that. So we are coming up on summer ministry season here at the church. So we have a couple of things we want to draw your attention to this morning. First, you'll hear from Angela about our VBS program coming this summer, and then Warren and Shelley about Silver Bay Bible Camp. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Where's all my kiddos? Are we all ready for VBS? Hey, awesome. Yeah, it's that time of year again for VBS, and this year's theme is monumental, so we'll be celebrating God's greatness, and uh, this will be from August 8th to the 12th, and the 15th to the 19th, from 9 till noon every day. For all ages, um, kids entering kindergarten to grade 6, and so, um, yeah, there's just great ways that you guys can be involved. Whether you love working with the children or you don't want to get close to the children, I have a job for every one of you. So if you can uh, pray for that and, um, yeah, just uh, pray for where you can be involved and how you can uh, help out this ch these children and also make that a good, safe week. Um, I need cookies. You want to bake some cookies? You need cookies. Uh, crew leaders, decorators, uh, station leaders, so whatever it is, just come and contact me or uh, get more information on our website. That would be great. Thank you.
Well, um, we're doing camp this year. That's great, great Woo! news. Uh, we haven't been able to do normal camp for uh, two years now, so it's really good news that we're able to do camp. We're so happy and pleased to be up here to tell you about what's going to happen this year. Uh, thanks to New Life Church. Thanks, Daniel, for uh, letting us be a missionary of the month. Um, over the years, so much, has, so much help has come from this church for our camp up at Silver Bay, and uh, we, are, <clears throat> we are so grateful for all that. Uh, many of you have worked at camp or have been counselors at camp or have um, been campers at camp over the years. In fact, uh, anybody who's been to camp, helped at camp, or been a, uh, a camper or a cook, or come out even for a weekend to pound some nails or uh, fill some holes of, uh, that are in the playground or anything, could you stand up, please, just so we can see how many people uh, from our church here? So thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, like I say, we haven't had a normal camp since 2019, so we're very happy to to do this. And many of you, there's a lot of new faces here. You might not have heard of Silver Bay Bible Camp before. So just a brief history. It started in 1939. My grandfather started as his missionary work in the Interlake. And over the years, it's passed down to my father and then down to me and down, down to our kids who are helping us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great ministry in the Interlake area. And uh, as I say, part of this church as well, too. We offer three weeks of camp each year. And uh, two weeks of junior camp, and um, a week of teen camp. So we just get a slide up here. To show, it's coming soon. I think there we go. Um, registration for each week of camp is only one dollar. We don't want to turn any anybody away who can't afford it. So camp is supported by your generous gifts, and that allows us to have anybody who wants to come to camp to to show up. This year, uh, the, you can see the dates of camp up there for ages 6 to 12, July 10th to the 15th, and then we have another uh, camp for ages 6 to 12 the following week. That's from a Sunday afternoon to Friday. And then we have a teen camp for grades 7 to 9 the following week, the 24th to the 29th. And right after that, on the 29th, we switch gears a little bit and we move into our family camp. So if you want to come out and bring your kids, stay as a family, you're welcome to come up. Um, that's $50 a person for the weekend. It's a great deal. includes all the meals. If you have your camper, you can bring it up. We'll find a place for you to plug in. Or if you need a place to stay, we have some cabins, first come, first serve, that you can, can stay in for the weekend. So we'd love to have you up for that. Uh, to register for camp, it's on our website. Just Google Silver Bay Bible Camp and it'll come up. There's a, red, a link to registration page and you can check in on there. Unfortunately, we are... Uh, just about full for a lot of our camps. We have some room in teen camp, and uh, you can check that out to see if you can uh, get registered for that. And for family camp, you can let Shelly or myself know. Uh, just give us a call or verbally tell us, and we'll, we'll save a spot for you. Um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of what's going on this year at camp. Uh, I'm going to invite Shelly to share a little bit more about the heart of camp and what we're all about, and we'll go through some slides as, as she talks. Okay, so Warren mentioned we're almost full. Girls are full for both junior camps, but there is still room for boys in those two camps. Okay, so what makes Silver Bay Silver Bay? Um, we maybe aren't your typical camp with a lot of fun activities like climbing walls or horseback riding or BMXing, but we are more of a relationship camp, and that isn't boring, really. Um, what it is is our main emphasis is on our relationships uh, uh, because we only take 48 campers each week, we get to know each one of them. Um, we get to know our counselors, we get to know the kids, and we even our cooks know the campers, and it's, it's actually a family atmosphere is what we kind of go, that's the way we go. And um, so our relationships are emphasized with each other, but especially with Jesus. Um, by the end of the week, as I said, we know most of the kids' names and who they are. We do have a lot of activities as well. We have archery, we have craft, we have bannock making, lots of games, the ever popular flannel graphs with Warren during chapel time, <laughs> right? They love that. And uh, even the counselors tend to sit in on those sometimes. And of course, we have rest and memory. <laughs> See, they say that each time. They, they really do like rest and memory. All right, um, as Warren mentioned, we still charge only a dollar a week. It used to be 50 cents, but inflation hit, and we put it up to a dollar. 
That's no word of a lie. Anyways, as we said, we don't want to turn any child or family away because it is expensive to send a kid to camp. And if you have a, a large family, it's, 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 it's a hard thing to do. It does cost us about $250 per child. And uh, most people do pay that as well as a lot more. And I have to say, the Lord has provided every year. We have never been without. In fact, we've done a lot of um, changes and upgrades to the camp every year. And we have brand new girls' dorms um, now. And yeah, the Lord has provided. It's been a blessing for our family uh, to be directing camp now, Lauren and I, for 31 years. And um, we could not do it without you guys, without our family's help, with this church and our friends. And uh, we are very thankful. We are out there most of the summer, Warren and I, so if you ever think about taking a drive up to Steep Rock, we're there. Just give us a call, give the camp a call, or give us a call in our cell. Coffee's always on, and you're more than welcome to stay if you want for a few days. Okay. Um, as Shelley said, a big uh, part of our, our camp is, is volunteer work. And um, you can see some slides of some of the volunteers over the years. And there's a, a slide of some of the counselors uh, leading music. And a big part of uh, what we do is, is having these young teens come out and uh, work for a, a week and uh, give a week of their summer to camp. And what we're going to try to do this year is try to hook up you with, as, uh, as a prayer partner with one of the kids. Would you be willing to pray for just one counselor leading up to camp and during camp? If you do, please sign up at the, we have a little table set up in the, in the back there. Give us your name and we'll match you up with one of the kids and we'll uh, get you to, to pray for them for, for the summer. Uh, they give a lot of their time and, uh, and talents and able to, to come out to camp, so we really appreciate if, if uh, we can match them up with prayer partners. So um, also besides that, speaking of volunteer work, if you would like to come out for a work weekend, we have two work weekends coming up. Uh, it'll be two weeks from right now, the 28th and 29th of May, and also... We have uh, the Father's Day weekend, June 18th and 19th. We've got a lot of work to do, some painting. We've got some construction to do in the boys' dorm or the girls' dorm to, uh, to get the bunks ready and get, get it ready for camp. So if you can come up, that would be great. Just let us know. And as Shelly said, we're up there lots of times during the week as well. So thank you very much again for all your support over the years. And just one final announcement as kids, you can head out to Sunday school now. So for those of you who hear about camp ministry and hear about VBS and that excites you, if you are student aged, um, we as a church want to be able to support you doing those things. So we as a church are going to essentially hire two students this summer to spend the month of July doing ministry at um, Silver Bay and then August here at the church helping set up and then run VBS. So if you're interested in doing that as a student, you can talk to either Warren or Angela or Rusty or myself, and you can apply to do that this summer. Well, this morning, we have the privilege of having Dr. Kevin Schuler here with us. Kevin is the Executive Director of the Baptist General Conference of Canada. For those of you who don't know, that is the denomination that we are a part of at New Life Church. It's a group of churches that want to work together to see the gospel spread throughout Canada. Kevin has a heart for the Word of God, a heart for pastors. It's so cool, just on a, on a pastoral level. The fact that the executive director of our denomination, I could just directly send an email at any point in time is really cool. He has a heart for our pastors, and we really appreciate that in him, and so we're excited to have him bring the Word of God for us this morning. But before he does, we'll spend some time in prayer, and then we'll hear his passage read, and then he will come to preach for us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. We can hear about these exciting things that you were doing through our church with VBS coming this summer and with Silver Bay and, and Warren and Shelley's work to run that camp for 31 years now, Father. We just thank you for their faithful service, and we thankful, thank you for your faithful provision to them as they have served. And Father, as we as a church pray for them throughout this month of May as our mission partner of the month, we just continue to ask that you would provide for those needs that as they let these kids attend for essentially nothing, they just want to bring them, to love them, to grow relationships with them, and to point them to Jesus, we just pray that you would provide 
that they would see fruit in that ministry, that kids would come to know your son through their time at that camp. We pray for the counselors as well as they go, that you would bless them in that time, but that they as well would be an incredible blessing to the kids they are leading and having fun with and overseeing and uh, getting to serve. Father, we pray now for us as a congregation, as we hear your word right, as we hear your word preached, we ask that your spirit would be at work in each one of us to encourage, to convict, to grow in us a greater love for you, for your word, for your son, for your spirit. We pray that as Kevin preaches for us this morning, that he would be guided by your spirit, that if there are things that he maybe didn't even intend to say today, but you would prompt him to that. Father, I pray for us as a congregation that we would be prepared to listen, we would be prepared to respond in obedience. We just pray now that you would bless this time where we can worship through the hearing of your word together in community. Amen. For those of you who have uh, brought your Bibles today, uh, you can turn to Amos. Everyone knows where Amos is, right? Uh, we are looking at chapter 7, verses 7 to 15. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Andrew Taves. Uh, my family and I have been attending New Life uh, for just over four years now. Verse 7, chapter 7. Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is hatching a plot against you right here on your very doorstep. What he is saying is intolerable. He is saying, Jeroboam will be soon killed, and the people of Israel will be sent away into exile. Then Amaziah sent orders to Amos, Get out of here, you prophet. Go on back to the land of Judah, and earn your living by prophesying there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. But Amos replied, I'm not a professional prophet, and I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd, and I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, Go and prophesy to my people in Israel. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you today. I had uh, the opportunity to speak here at this church when um, Lauren Meisner was the interim uh, leader. And uh, uh, it's good to be back. You know, it's uh, great to be here, be with uh, Rusty, Erica, and... Uh, just uh, the joy of being with them. And of course, uh, Daniel and Damaris, too. Uh, I have uh, Damaris's father is one of our BGC pastors in Alberta. So he and I go fishing together, and I've had her brothers in the boat with me. And uh, we've had some great times there at the church there in Killam. So it's, uh, it's, good to, you know, it's good to be part of the family of churches. We had a conference here at your church this weekend, Friday and Saturday. The Central District met. And uh, it was good to be here with all the pastors from Northwest Ontario and Manitoba. And that was delightful to be here and to be part of that meeting. And then uh, to stay over and preach here on Sunday is just great. So it's, uh, I love the renovations that you've done. It looks great in here. And, uh, you know, I remember the building the way, the way it used to be. And so very, very nice progress you're making. Very exciting to see all of that. All right, so my name is Kevin, and uh, I am the executive director of our Conference of Churches. We have churches that go from Vancouver Island all the way to Halifax, and most of our churches are in the West, and so we have uh, 120 churches across the country, and, and I give oversight to them, as well as our missions and our seminary and the president of our seminary, and uh, it's very uh, full, full job, and I enjoy being out in the churches, meeting people like you and uh, being able to share God's Word together. So what, what are we trying to do in the BGC? Why are you part of this, this conference? Well, here's what we want to do. We want to have our health, healthy church. We want to have healthy churches. Coming out of COVID, 
<clears throat> Many of our pastors are discouraged, wondering where all their people are. Some of the smaller communities, it hasn't affected them as hard, but the city churches, many people are too afraid to come back and just disappeared, not answering texts, emails. And that's very discouraging for pastors. You know, they, before COVID, their churches were moving forward, and then when COVID came, they had to follow the regulations and stop meeting, stop holding services. And it was, uh, it's been hard. None, none, no pastor went to school to study how to be a pastor in a time of a pandemic. Uh, we were all trained to have your congregation with you, and you walk with them, and you pray with them, and you love them, and you support them. And then when you can't see people, you can't touch, uh, talk to them, can't be with them, very hard for our pastors. And then sometimes within the church, there's conflict over mandates and masks and vaccines, and pastors are feeling that push-pull that happens inside the congregation. And so we want to have healthy churches. We want to have... Churches that are uh, moving forward and, and advocating for the, the, the work of the Lord. The other thing we're trying to do is plant new churches all across the country. And Canada is desperately short of gospel preaching churches. There's large parts of our country where there's church buildings, but there's not the gospel being preached in those communities. And so our goal and our vision is to plant new churches all across our country. And then I'm also giving leadership to our seminary. It's on the campus of Trinity Western University in Langley, B.C. And uh, we just had our graduation in April. We had three years of grads come for 20, 21, 22. COVID, we couldn't have grad services. And it was so nice to see the platform filled with uh, graduates, people getting their master's and doctorate degrees. And if you're interested in furthering your theological education, you could go to our website, Canadian Baptist Seminary, and you could see about online courses you could take. You don't have to go to Langley or attend in Langley in person. You can do everything online. We've had pastors who have taken their whole degree online, and the only time they went on campus was graduation day when they walked across the platform and got their degree. So there's a uh, seminary, and we're very excited about what God's doing there. We have uh, this year, we have 450 students in our seminary, individuals, 450 individuals, not everybody's full-time. Hardly anybody goes to seminary full-time. Most people just take in a class here and there. But we have 450 people in our seminary, so that's very, very encouraging. The other thing that we're doing across uh, the, the world is we want to tell the good story of Jesus everywhere. The Great Commission. We've been told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so what we do is we, we work with national churches that are uh, already planted around the world. Our missionaries from... The West have been going into uh, the world for 300 years, and there's networks of churches that have been established. <clears throat> a lot of these churches need more resourcing, training, leadership development, pastoral uh, development. And so uh, BGC works with those kind of churches. We have 32 missionaries from the BGC that are out around the world. We also want to send more people from Canada and uh, be involved in the ministry of, uh, of the Great Commission. And so if you feel like God is... Speaking to you about missionary service, we have, you know, short term, just a few weeks. We have a two-year, we call it midterm, and then we have career. If you want to think about making a career of missions, and, uh, well, the mission world has changed. You, you, you don't need to be a theologian to go on mission. Uh, we need carpenters, and we need engineers, and we need English teachers, and, you know, there's just so many ways that you could be involved in mission and give some of your life back to the church around the world and see the gospel go forward. Our mission statement of the BGC is that we are a network of churches that make disciples who live and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in their community, Canada, and the nations. So you're one of our network. We have 120 churches all across the country. New Life here in Stonewall uh, is one of our churches. And uh, we're so thankful for your support, for your prayer, for the way that you care for us and support the ministry of the BGC. And this is our dream, is that we want to have a network, and we want it to be a growing network of building more churches who, two things, who live the gospel and spread the gospel. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our message today. Let me tell you about one thing we're doing in missions that I think uh, is very exciting. We, we have a satellite TV program into Iran. <clears throat> You see that little country of Armenia there, the orange, uh, and Iran is right below it. So for many years, the BGC was 
bringing house church leaders out of Iran into Armenia and training them and then sending them back into Iran. COVID came and we couldn't travel there to do the teaching and the people from Iran could not come into Armenia because the border was closed. So when that happened, we were wondering, well, what's going to happen to our international discipleship training? And the Lord opened the door for do a TV ministry into Iran. So you see there on the screen, House of Omid, that's our ministry in BC. It's in Coquitlam, BC. It's a Farsi word. Omid means hope, House of Hope. And so with House of Hope and BGC Canada, we've been doing a, a three times a week, we're on air in Iran. I'm doing a lot of the teaching. There's others that are doing the teaching. Um, my messages get translated into Farsi, but uh, we're, we're on the air in Iran. And we're getting so much response now from inside the country. So many people wanting to get a Bible and who is Jesus and how do I become a Christian and how do I grow as a Christian? At the satellite TV company said, you know, we're getting so many calls from your program, you're going to have to hire your own staff and, uh, you know, start answering and looking after these calls. So we have gone into Armenia and where we see that black arrow, that's right about where the capital city of Armenia is, a city called Yerevan. We bought a house between the BGC and House of Omid. We bought a house, six bedroom house. And instead of now bringing a bunch of people up once a year and training them and sending them back, we're going to just try to have a trickle of people coming up. And they can come into the house, kind of be a respite center, and be trained and discipled. You know, Iran has anti-conversion laws. So if you convert from Islam, you can be fired from your job, you can be expelled from university, you can be arrested, you can be put in prison, you can even be put to death, some have been over the years. And so it's very oppressive to the Christian church. But in spite of that, the church inside Iran is growing exponentially. So many people are coming to faith. And so they don't have any way to be discipled. There's no Bible school. There's no older Christians. Everybody's first-generation believers there. They're coming to faith through satellite TV programs and all kinds of different ways that God is working in the country. <clears throat> and there's uh, this great group of brand-new Christians. So we want to step into this and help disciple them. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we bought this house, and the goal now will be is to bring people out of Iran secretly into Armenia. Our Iranians go to Armenia on vacation. It'd be like you saying, well, I'm going to go to Riding Mountain for a week. You know, nobody, your neighbors wouldn't think anything strange if you said you're going to, to, to Clear Lake for a week. And uh, if someone in Iran says I'm going to Armenia, oh, you know, they think you're just going on vacation. So they can travel up there and come to our house that we've bought and be encouraged and helped. Now, this is where I want to invite the VGC to be part of this is we would love to see churches like New Life send teams of people over there to bless these Iranian believers. They all want to practice their English. So you say, I don't know Farsi. I can't do very I wouldn't know. They want, to, they want to practice their English. And they've never seen a Christian marriage. They've never seen a Christian family, how children you know, react to parents. They haven't seen how a husband and wife you know, connect with each other and love each other. They have no models because it's all first-generation believers. They're all coming out of Islam, very uh, dark and, and, and uh, you know, repressive uh, theology of Islam, especially when it comes to family issues. So they need, they need to see the model of Christian people and just the way Christians love and care for one another. They need to see that model. So when, when, we're, when we get this set up, I'm going there in July, we're going to get the house, we're going to put the furniture in it, get it all set up. We can start having teams like from New Life coming and just being there for a week and 10 days, whatever you can do. And uh, just to bless and encourage the Iranian believers and you'd get to meet some persecuted Christians and you'd get to uh, have an opportunity to you know, be in con contact with them. Uh, here's a picture of what we did do in uh, our previous times, and these Iranian believers would get together, we'd bring them to a, a Christian camp inside Armenia, and they would sing, and, and you know, in, in their house church, they can't sing out loud, they have to, have to whisper, because they don't want their neighbors to hear what they're doing. And so they, uh, they, they were able to sing and be taught and, and pray together, it was exciting. So we want to do what you're seeing there, we want to do that on a smaller level. Armenia is a Christian country, so there's no fear of persecution there. 
And our meetings, our meeting is fascinating. And when you're in Yerevan, you look out and right in the distance, there's Mount Ararat, you know, where the Bible says the ark landed. And so you can, you're, you're right there. You can, uh, and there's so many interesting church history things in Armenia that are just fascinating. So it'd be a great place for someone from New Life to come and serve and care for these believers. You know, in their, in their house church, they, they just usually have four or five, six people because if you get arrested, you don't know that many Christians that you can't turn in. Because when you get arrested, there's a lot of pressure on you. A husband and wife that were in this picture right here, uh, they were arrested and uh, separated for 30 days and harshly questioned. And uh, pressure was put on them to reveal more Christians. And uh, so they need a place to come and be loved and cared for. And so if uh, that works out for you, plan, I'm sure we'll tell you more about that as we get more of those details. All right, so let's get into our text here from Amos. Amos chapter 7, and God uses And he says, Amos, here's a plumb line. Now, you know what a plumb line is. It's a weight at the bottom of a string. And gravity, when you're building something, and you want to see if your wall is straight, if your wall is crooked, if it's starting to teeter a bit, the plumb line is just a very simple way to tell if you're building your wall straight. Nowadays, of course, we have laser levels and all kinds of other tools. But if you're ever stuck and you're building a fence or something, here's a simple way to make sure you're doing it straight. So God uses this idea of the plumb line. And look what it says here in Amos chapter 7. God is putting a plumb line among his people. Of course, the plumb line is his word. And he is, his word is that which tells us if we're living right or we need to correct. When the builder is putting a wall up and the plumb line shows that the, the wall is going crooked, does the builder get mad at the plumb line? Or does the builder adjust the wall so that it's now in plumb? Well, if he wants his wall to stand up for a long time, he'll make sure that he adjusts it with plumb. And so this is what God does. In this vision here in Amos chapter 7, he says, The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And Amos says, well, I see a plumb line. So what is the plumb line? Well, of course, for us as Baptists, as Christians, we believe that you know, the word of God is our plumb line. This is the, how we build our life. Like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the wise man hears my word and builds his life on my words and has got a solid foundation. And when the rains fall and the winds blow, uh, the house won't fall down because it's on a firm foundation. The foolish man hears the word but doesn't build his life on it, builds it on the sand. And then when the same storm comes, The house falls over because it's not properly rooted. So always this great question of our lives is, who is our authority? Who is our authority? The plumb line can give you great confidence that you are right with God when you follow his word and you look at what the word of God says how to live and you say, well, you know what? My, My life is matching up to the plumb line. That gives you confidence as a believer that you're on the right track. But it can also rebuke us when there's things in our life that are not in plumb with the Word of God, that are not properly being uh, lived out the way the Bible says, and that should correct us. We shouldn't get angry and say, the plumb line is wrong. We should say, I need to adjust my life to the Bible. My pastor taught me many years ago. He said, Kevin, I don't correct the Bible. The Bible corrects me. And if you have the plumb line of God's word as your standard, you'll make some wise and godly choices that will protect your life from so many mistakes, from so many sins and harmful temptations when we're following the word of God. It's the lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And that's what the word of God is. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, our goal is to please him, the Father, How do I please him? Well, I follow his word. Jesus said in John chapter 8, I do always what pleases the Father. And so this means we have to develop a biblical worldview. Uh, The worldview, of course, is that orientation of our heart 
that gives us the foundation on which we function in our daily lives. So some people wake up in the morning and they're thinking, who can I cheat? Who can I swindle? Who can I get over on? How can I use people? That's their worldview. For the Christian, we should have a different approach to life. We should follow the word of God. And so if you're going to have a biblical worldview, it's going to include these things, that understanding that the world is lost and fallen, but that God loves the world, that he created, and that he's on mission now to redeem people and creation back to himself. And so the plumb line of God's word calls us to understand this. 1 John 5, 12 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. The plumb line of God's word makes it so plain. You're either saved or you need to be saved. You need the gospel. And so God is on mission to do this very thing, to redeem the world. So when we think about this, we recognize that we're living in a world that doesn't have the same worldview as the Christian or the Bible would present. The Western worldview is much different. In the West, we had what was called the modern worldview for many years. There was a man about 500 years ago named Rene Descartes, and you might remember reading about him in your high school or college class. You know, he was doubting everything. You know, does the world exist? Does this room exist? Do I exist? But you remember what he said? I think, so therefore I must exist. I must, I'm, I'm thinking, so therefore I must exist. And so when he started teaching that, it started to show people, hey, man or humans are now the center of life, not God. Up until Descartes, people got their worldview from the Bible, what the, and especially if you're from the Western world, the Western Europe culture. This is how you got your worldview is what the Word of God said. But he started saying, I think, therefore, and so man now became the center. And so out of that became all of this uh, modern worldview of reason. Everything has to, if I can reason, if, I can, if it makes sense to me, then I'll follow it. And so uh, when, uh, when the individualism and, and then, of course, when evolution came out of that and then this sort of this inevitability that evolution, things are just going to get better and better continually and we're just going to keep evolving higher and higher. This is all from the modern worldview. But in the 20th century, some terrible things happened in the world. There was world wars. There was genocide. There was famine. There was dictators. There was an atomic bomb being dropped on cities. And people started saying, wait, science, maybe they don't have all the answers. And maybe this, you know, we've got to rethink life. And so uh, this, now we're living in what's called the postmodern worldview, the rejection of anything that is certain. The postmodernist uh, has no grand story to explain life. So like we've talked about the biblical worldview that God created us and that he's on mission and he invites us to come with him on mission. The, mod- the postmodernist has no grand story. They, they think the universe is random and we are just here by accident. And, uh, and so when you are certain about something, they're suspicious of you. When we say what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father without me, the postmodern mindset goes, wait, 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 you're you're too sure of that. You're just too sure. You can't be that sure. And so they don't believe there's any grand story to explain things. As one of the scientists said, Stephen Hawking, we're just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star. There is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. We, we're just here randomly. we just got to try to make the best of it while we're here. So these clash of these worldviews, how do we work together in this? Well, I think the story of Amos helps us. So let's remind ourselves a little bit about who Amos is. He was a shepherd that was called to prophesy. Amos 1, verse 1. This message was given to Amos, a shepherd from the town of Tekoa in Judah. Now you might remember from your reading of the Old Testament that for a while Israel was together as one nation. There was David and Solomon. But then when Solomon's son came to the throne, there was a civil war and the ten tribes broke away and just the southern tribe of Judah was left in the south. And so now there's two nations, formerly one, now two. 
And Amos is in the south, and God is telling him to go north to a hostile culture, to a people with a different worldview than what he had. He was a shepherd that was called to prophesy. Now let me ask you this. Can God call you away from what you're doing right now to serve him vocationally? I know we all serve the Lord with our lives. We're supposed to. We get up, my life is for you, Lord. We just sang, you know, Be Thou My Vision. That's a great worldview song. Be Thou My Vision. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. You are my inheritance now and always. High King of Heaven. You know, we just sang all that. that that's worldview. Be thou my vision. I mean, that's perfect. And so uh, Amos was, uh, you know, in the south, minding his business, looking after the sheep. And God says, Amos, I'm calling you. I need you to go and bring a message for me. And he did. He obeyed. You know, the Old Testament prophets, when you read the Old Testament prophecies, they had two roles. They, they, first, they preached hard against what was wrong in the, in the culture and the, the dominant consciousness. And they said, look, God's going to dismantle everything that is unjust and everything that oppresses. God's going to dismantle that. And then the second thing the prophet did was announce that there's this new, good, just thing that God is building or planting. It's coming behind so there's a tearing down of what's wrong and then a building up of what's new. And this is what Amos was called to do, to go from his home in his southern kingdom and travel north and then to start delivering this message. Well, you can imagine that when this message came to the people, they didn't receive it that well. When people are not living on the plumb line of God's word, when a pastor or a friend or a cousin or somebody rebukes us and says, you know, you're not living right. You should be true to your marriage vows. Why are you not being faithful? And when somebody calls us to live by the plumb line of God's word, the uh, receiver or the hearer doesn't always get too excited about hearing that message. So look at what some of Amos' preaching was. Chapter 4, God's trying to reach Israel in many ways. God says it you know, I sent famine to you, but I didn't get your attention. I stopped the rain from falling, but you didn't come back to me. Your crops failed, and you still wouldn't turn around. And then even disease came. And so then in chapter 4 of Amos, in verse 12, there's this famous verse from the book. So I've tried all these different things, and you didn't listen, so now prepare to meet your God. <clears throat> I used to pastor in southern Ontario, and... A farmer was in our church, and his property was on the four, four-way stop out in the country. And so he put this sign up on the four-way stop on his land, prepare to meet your God, and then our church name underneath it. So one day, a man came into the church office, and he said, you know, I've I, I, I got to tell you something. I, I see that your name is on that sign about prepare to meet your God, this church name. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I need to... I need, to, I need to talk about this. He says, I hate that sign. I'll drive out of my way five, six miles so I don't have to go by that sign. It bothers me every time I go there and prepare to meet your God. And, it, and he says, and then when the corn is growing up and it covers the bottom of the sign and all that's left is prepare. Just prepare. And he, he just, you know, it, it just bothered him. And so he knew that, he, that God was speaking to him. And so from that... Uh, he became a believer, his family, his wife, his children, baptized them all. They are now uh, traveling and singing and doing ministry uh, part-time and, you know, there's, uh, preaching in churches. What was the starting, the entry point was he couldn't get away from the power of that message, prepare to meet your God. God's word was calling him and speaking to his heart. God says, come back to me and live, Israel. Come back. Then in chapter 5, <clears throat> look at how Amos is preaching about social issues that are going on in the country. You know, you talk about social justice and, you know, what's God's heart for that? Well, look at what Amos says. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. I mean, he's laying it out to the people. God says, I hate all your show of pretense. 
the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellion. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Do what is good. Run from evil so that you may live. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. You know, we sing here in the church, and in Israel they were singing, and God looked down and heard their singing, but he said, it doesn't mean anything to me because I can see what's going on in your life. Your, your life is not right. Your ni- life is not living by the plumb line. And then he, Jane Amos says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. If you've ever stood by Niagara Falls, <clears throat> see that water just, and God says, <clears throat> I want the, my justice to roll down across the world like that. Martin Luther King in his famous I Have a Dream speech, he quoted this at the end of that speech, you know, where he was preaching and, and calling America to racial justice and racial equality. And, and, you know, I have a dream that one day my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I have a dream, and he's talking about this. And at the very end of that speech, he says, he quotes from Amos 5, let justice roll down. And the prophet Amos is preaching this message to this northern kingdom. So this message created conflict. And we read this in, in, when the scripture was read, but let me just go over it again. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you. The land is not able to bear all his words. So, you know, the religious authorities, the religious leaders, and the political leaders, they didn't want this message being preached. And, and the postmodern worldview does not want the gospel message of the plumb line being preached. It's, everybody's okay. Everybody's doing their own thing. We're all going to make it. Everybody's going to be okay. So the, what did they say to Amos? O oh, seer, flee away to Judah and prophesy there, but never again come back here to Bethel. And then Amos answered and said, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. The Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. So when you're going to give God's word to people, there's going to be some conflict. We have to do it with grace, with the Spirit's power, but we shouldn't hold back from preaching God's word to a culture that is not in plumb with his word. See, culture has always questioned the word of God. It started back in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? When Satan came to Eve and said, did God really say, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you'll die? And right there, he, right first couple chapters of the Bible, the word of God's being questioned. And that's been the devil's strategy ever since, is to question the word of God and to cast doubt on the word of God. And so now... How can I develop this biblical worldview? You say, well, I want, I want to you know, have this. What do I do? Well, a couple of things. Always going back to the scriptures, right? So Jesus, they asked him, what was the greatest command in the Bible? They tried to trap him with that question. And Jesus taught us something about hermeneutics, about how to interpret the Bible. You know, the Lord could have said, all the Bible is equally inspired. I think you, you quoted that scripture at the start in, the, in, the, in your leading the worship. All scripture is inspired by God. He could have said that. And it's true, it is. But Jesus said, well, actually, there's two commands that kind of bubble up. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great command. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then Jesus said, the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Leviticus 19. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what he's saying is everything's built off of these two commands. So to love God is my first, if I'm going to have a biblical worldview, I've got to love the Lord. I've got to love him. I've got to worship him. I need to follow him, obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? It's, it, our, love for Jesus is shown in how we live. And then the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. So how do I love myself? Well, if I've got a scratchy throat like I do right now, I I go and I get some medicine and I take a lozenge and try to soothe my throat. If I'm tired, I put myself into a comfortable bed and sleep. 
If I'm hungry, I get something to eat. I, if I'm thirsty, I get myself a drink. If I'm cold, I put on a sweater or turn up the heat in the house. I, I take care of myself. That's how I love myself. And that's the same way that we're supposed to love others. What I want for myself, I want for others. I want my kids to have a good education. I want everybody to have a good education. I want to have health care. I want everybody to have access to health care. I want to, you know, I want a free society, that, and, and I enjoy a free society. I want that for, what a, how I love me is how I want to then love others that very same way. And so living for others, living, loving God and then living for others. And then the third part about developing a biblical worldview is the Great Commission, that we're here not just to make money and to plan our vacations and our next cruise and our next uh, toy that we want to buy, but we're here on mission. God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. He didn't give it to the angels. He didn't give it to, you know, uh, write it in the sky, a message in the sky, come back to God. Give it to us. We're the plan. We're the, the vehicle. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. We represent Jesus on your street, at your work, in your family, with your circle of influence, your friends, the people you know. You are Christ's ambassador. God is making his appeal through us. God's up in heaven. Through us is how the appeal comes. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. That's what Amos said. Come back to God. I sent you famine. I sent you disease. Uh, you didn't have crops. I, I, you know, I allowed all these things to happen. And come back to me. Prepare to meet your God. And Paul is picking up that same thing here, saying, we speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you think about your life, and you look at how you're prioritizing your life, are you on mission with God? You know, your bank statement reveals a lot about where your priorities are. Money's a, always a big test for us. For us, money is often the biggest test that we'll have to deal with. What will we do with the wealth that God has entrusted to us? I'm going to be material-minded, or I'm going to be mission-minded? When you look at your bank statement, what do you see? Me, 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 also me, more me. Where, where, where do you see church? Where do you see feeding the poor, helping the refugees, giving to camp, giving to missions? Where do you see that in your bank statement? That, that's a good test of worldview. Money can buy you a house but can't make it a home. Money can buy you a bed but not a good night's sleep. Money can buy you food but not give you an appetite. Money can get you medicine but not good health. Money can't buy you respect. It can't stop others from judging you. It cannot buy you talent or give you a clean conscience. But it can be a tool in God's hands so that the world can be blessed through the wealth that he has entrusted to you. And so, of course, we're not talking about selling all your stuff and giving it away. But we're talking about being a, a conduit, as God has blessed you, and be a conduit to others. I, I think the best way to love your neighbor is to tell them about what Jesus did for you. You know, we can feed people, and clothe people, and educate people, and uh, give them good health care, but if they die and go to hell because we didn't tell them the gospel, then have we really, truly helped them? Yes, we've helped them for the time that they're on this life, but eternity stretches on forever. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So Jesus helped us with this. In this postmodern world, you think, well, how can we possibly begin to uh, make a in, in dent? So Christian, go ahead and move the slides forward there. So uh, my father is always at work. Jesus said, God's always at work. Do you know God's at work on your street? He's touching people on your neighborhood. He's talking to them. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. 
Christ is working. The Father's working. The Son is working. And then Jesus said the Spirit is working. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes or where it's going, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. You know, when we live on the prairies, we get to drive in the fall through the, the country roads and, and sometimes that tall grain and then there'll just be a little puff of wind that goes through and you see the wind go through the grass and it's kind of nice to see that. And that's what Jesus said, the Spirit's like that. The wind blows and you can't tell where it's going or where it's coming, but people are born of the Spirit. So the Father's at work, the Son is at work, the Spirit's at work, the Trinity is at work. Now, will you be the voice to help bring somebody to know Jesus? Somebody told me the gospel. Somebody brought the gospel to you. Might have been your parents, Sunday school teacher, youth worker. Maybe it was a sign on the field, like prepare to meet your God. But some way, you, you came. And now, don't let the chain stop with you. Uh, pass it on. And so tell your own story about Jesus saving you. In this postmodern world, that's, your story is valuable. What Christ did for you. You don't have to take hours and hours to explain your story. You can just tell it simply in three or four sentences. And just let somebody hear what Jesus did for you. The world is lost. Uh, our people in Canada, they don't know what Christmas is anymore. They don't know what Easter is anymore. They don't know why we have uh, Thanksgiving Day. All of that is our Christian heritage that has been slowly eroded away uh, with their postmodern culture. You've got a blank slate to work on. And tell your story about what Christ did for you. And then, of course, prayer. You know, who's on your prayer list? Is it just me and mine? God bless my spouse, bless my wife, my kids, my grandkids. Keep us all safe. Help us to do well. Amen? Well, okay, it's good to pray for your family. But are you praying for your neighbor? Are you praying for that irritating person at work, that annoying person? You know, maybe the reason God's brought that person into your life is to help you learn how to pray for somebody. See, there's theology behind mission that God wants to rescue the lost. And so when I have a proper worldview, it aligns my thinking, my spending, my time priorities. It gives life purpose and it gives a reason to get up and keep going. Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, You were bought with a price, therefore you are not your own. Not your own. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. I belong to him. He's my Lord. I love him. I want to follow him. I want to serve him. When we celebrate Easter last month, we think about all that Jesus did for us. His betrayed, falsely accused, beaten, crucified. He became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. They mocked him and they said, come down from the cross. If you're really the son of God, come down, then we'll believe. But he stayed on that cross. And every drop of that blood that was being shed was purchasing redemption. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so a Savior like that, who did that for me, my worldview says, I'm going to follow that Lord. I'm going to live for that Lord. I'm going to align my life and priorities so I can please him because look what he did for me. Like that camp chorus says, Though no one join me, still I will follow. doesn't matter how many are with me on the road following Jesus. My worldview says I want to serve my Lord and be faithful to him. So let's, let's close with the mission of God. So what is it? <clears throat> Martin Luther talked about the missio dei, the mission of God. God's mission is reconciliation. He's in the world trying to bring bring people back to him. When Adam and Eve sinned, <clears throat> he didn't stay up in heaven. But what, <clears throat> what do we read? <clears throat> Excuse me. We read, he came looking, he said, Adam, where are you? And that's what God's been doing ever since. He's been looking for people to bring them back to himself. Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who were lost. So God started in Genesis 12 with Abraham. He called Abraham and he said, move away from your parents' family 
Move to a land that I'm going to show you, and there I'm going to make of you a great nation, and you're going to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Of course, thinking about Jesus, who would come out of that line of Abraham. But God put Israel right in a spot in geography where all of the trade routes, the caravan routes, had to pass through Israel. Going from Africa, going from Asia, going from Europe. They all passed through Israel. And there was this witness that would go out to the world, to the nations. Hey, there's this people that they don't have idols. They don't have pagan gods. They have one God. They call him Jehovah. And the witness of Jehovah was to go out through the whole world. But as we read in the Old Testament, Israel couldn't live up to that worldview. And they often got corrupted by the false gods and the pagan gods. And we're reading here in Amos about just exactly that. God's calling his people back to him, saying, come back. You, you, you know, the plumb line. You, you need to come back. So that's the Old Testament. Then Jesus came. And, of course, he was the embodiment of the mission of God. Everything about Jesus was perfect. The way he talked to people, the way he healed people, the way he fed people, the way he uh, led and the instructions. He was God in the flesh. And he, he was uh, on mission to seek and to save the lost. And went to the cross. And he died on the cross for my sins and your sins. And he took our place. The, just, the, the judgment of a just God that should be on me for my sins, God put it on his own son, Jesus Christ. And as Jesus hung on that cross, he cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the father couldn't even look at his own son as he became sin for all of us and bore the sin of the world upon himself. But now the Lord's gone back to heaven. And what has he done? He's left his church on earth to continue the mission that began with Abraham and Israel, with Jesus, and now with us, the church. We're to continue the mission of God. And so we follow as best we can with the Spirit's empowerment, direction from the Word. And we stumble and don't live up to our worldview. We confess our sins and God forgives us and restores us to fellowship. And the best moment of your life is when you open your eyes after praying and, you, and things are right between you and God. That, that's the best moment. There's nothing between my soul and the Savior. And we get realigned with the worldview and then get up, dust off, Keep on going. And so, as we close this morning, when you think about the plumb line of God's word, does it give you reassurance that your life is on track with God? Or are there things in your life that are tipping, teetering, that are out of plumb? Let me encourage you this morning to do what God told Israel in Amos chapter 7. To line up with the word of God, er, to the plumb line of God's word, which we believe is the word of God. It's the best way to live. And it will be a blessing to you, to your family, to your church, to your nation. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask you, God, to minister to our hearts through it. Lord, the plumb line of your word is straight and true and calls us strongly to obey and follow. Help us, Lord, to not shrink back, not give in, but to be faithful in this time. We ask your blessing on New Life Church, Lord. Thank you for, for Rusty and Daniel, for the leaders here, for all that are serving. We lift them up to you, Lord, and pray your blessing and empowerment over them. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. A sermon that ended on time. How about that? Hey. <laughs> It can be done. Thanks a lot. Uh, but in all honesty, I uh, want to thank you, Kevin, on behalf of our church. I guess for, for a few things. You know, like as a pastor, I've been a part of other groups of churches. Um, I just want you to know we are fortunate to be a part of a wonderful family of churches. And you are giving excellent leadership to our, to our family um, and uh, ensuring that our, our, our churches are, are in alignment with, with God's plumb line. And uh, thank you for leading us in biblical faithfulness as a body, but also to be outward looking and to carry the mission of God into our nation and into our world. So we want to bless you in your leadership as you lead our family of churches. And uh, thank you for bringing this, this word of, I, I guess, both encouragement and challenge. Did you feel encouraged? 
Did you feel challenged? I think we're supposed to feel both of those, right? I once heard it said that the, the job of a preacher is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. And uh, I'm really good at troubling people, I found. Sometimes that comforting part, that can be a little bit harder, but I don't know about you, but I found myself kind of both uh, encouraged and, and challenged, maybe a little bit troubled, right? And so I, I kind of hope you were too, right? Encouraged that God loves us, so he's given us his word so that we can live a good life, experience life to the fullest. God has made his word and his will known to us. That is his love for us, which we see in its fullness in Jesus who died so that we might be reconciled to God. And then we're, we're, we're challenged. Like, how, are we living in alignment with that? Are we on mission? Are we being faithful as, as individuals and as families and as a church? And um, or are we loving God? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's not about checking the box. It's about loving God. Am I loving God with my life? Um, you gave us some examples of what that could look like, right? Loving others as we love ourselves and helping the poor and, and uh, helping refugees. And so uh, you're maybe already aware that here in a few minutes, we, uh, we're going to have a short info session. Uh, as a church, we've decided that we are going to, um, we're, we're going to bring over and adopt and support a Ukrainian refugee family. And they could be here in a few weeks. Maybe more than one family, if you're really generous. We'll see. But uh, this is one way that we can be a tangible blessing. Did you know Jesus was a refugee? Jesus was a refugee. He fled to Egypt and he came back. And we, we, we can help bless others in need. So, um, And the cool thing was that house of Omid in Iran, I, I didn't know a lot of that information. But because you were generous last year as a church, uh, we had a little bit of extra money. We decided, how, how are we going to use this money? So a couple weekends ago, uh, we decided we're going to take some money to help Ukrainian refugees, and we're taking, we decided to take $6,000 of that surplus from last year and send it to House of Omid to support that project. So I want you to know that because of your generous giving last year, we had a bit of extra, and we're sending 6000 of that to help that ministry that, that you've just heard about. So that's exciting, and uh, maybe God will use us to do more. But the, the team is going to close us here with one final song. And then we're just going to give you a few minutes. If you want to retrieve your kids from Sunday school, use the washroom, grab a cup of coffee. And then uh, here at about um, 1220, at 1220, just take a few minutes to do what you need to do. And if you want to be back here for a short info session, okay, uh, Gerald Hubner from Arburg is here. He's kind of, he's leading this initiative. And he, we're going to partner with Gerald to, to bring over a family. He's going to take 15 minutes to do a short presentation. Then there'll be some Q&A. So it will not be a long info session, but I just encourage you, if you're able, to stick around. That'll start here at about 12.20 or so. And so I want you to stand, church, as we um, prepare ourselves uh, to, to worship God in song one final time. Let me pronounce this blessing over us, a blessing that was given to that first church almost 2,000 years ago. We have it at the end of the book of Hebrews. Let's receive this blessing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. And together with one voice we say, amen. Let's worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath with you.
other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. No, we live for you. so much for joining us here this morning. May God be praised above all else. Go and have a great week, and God bless you all. We'll see you soon.